Good morning and welcome to our worship service. The bond between a father and daughter is so important. We want to honor that relationship by inviting you to attend the father-daughter date night at the park on Saturday, April 9th. Girls and MGBC kids or youth ministries can invite any special man in their life. It could be dad, grandpa, or an uncle. Sorry, no boyfriends, please. Today is the final day to purchase tickets. Information is available at the information desk in the lobby. We will follow our regular Sunday morning schedule format for Easter Sunday. Sunday school and ABF classes will begin at 9 a.m., followed by a single worship service at 10.15 a.m. For more information on these and other ministries, be sure to go to our website at mgbconline.com. May God be praised through our worship this morning. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us here. Thanks for joining us online. If you're in the building, we'd like to invite you to stand as we read our call to worship together from the first four verses in John chapter 1. Let's read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything in him was life, and the life was the light of men. All right, let's sing together. Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky. The heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord all high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. Universe. 
earth declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of heaven and earth. Amen. You can stay standing. The choir is going to lead us in a hymn called There is a Fountain.
Well, we want to welcome you to the Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church today. Thank you for all that are here today, as well as those joining us online. Uh, thank you for tuning in, and uh, it's good to be back. I have been away for five weeks. I was in Turkey for a week and then went on a sabbatical, and there's no place like home. So really glad well, to be back. Well, if you're happy to have Brent back, let's uh, clap for him. I mean, I told everyone last week how much I missed you. I heard about that. I heard that uh, actually a movie rated higher than me. But other than that, uh, that I'm... part was not supposed to get back to you. <laughs> but uh, Brant's back. So, anyways, let's let's uh, move on so I don't embarrass myself any anymore. So uh, we have communion service taking place here on April fifteenth. That's our Good Friday service. It's our three part communion service. We'll be passing food as well as the bread and cup. Uh, please uh, be sure to sign up on the clipboards that are going to be. Can we uh, pass the clipboards around the end of the aisles? Make sure to please sign up so we can have an accurate number of the resources we'll need for that night. And it, it is truly good to be back. And um, one of the things that I was able to do was visit some other churches. I was hoping to go a little further away, and then we had all those snowy Sundays, so that was weird. But uh, I was able to visit some of our local churches, which was really good. But there's no place like home. And just being here for our, our worship and just seeing all of you, it's, it's really good. It's good to be back with the staff as well uh, this week. And uh, this is my family. So it's just really, really good to be here. And uh, I'm really excited about this month as we begin this series on the gospel. It might seem a little basic to some of us because some of us have been around a while. But we need to be reminded every day of the gospel the gospel isn't just for the lost, it's for us. We, we can believe the lies of this world many times in our head, and we need to hear the good news. We need good news, the good news of the gospel and what it's done in our life. If you weren't able to pick up one of these brochures that explains the four weeks, our topics that we'll be reviewing each week, you can pick these up on the literature tables as you leave today. And I hope you're excited about today's message as Daryl will be leading us off on our series today, as well as many of you are in our ABF hour. We're using the same theme, different topics, or different scriptures, so it doesn't repeat. But uh, if you'd like to join, this is a good time to get involved with the ABF Adult Bible Fellowships. If you aren't a part of one, uh, it's a good time to jump in because we're all doing the same thing. And then on May 1st, we're going to have an elective as well as our regular classes. Many of you have been asking about my trip to Turkey with Dr. Randy Smith. And I learned very much uh, from that experience, posted photos on Facebook and so forth. But we've decided it would be neat to have an elective series for eight weeks, starting May 1st. It will go through Father's Day. The first week will be a background um, lesson uh, to give us background to what's happening there in the book of Revelation, as well as our cult, the, the cultural background, the Roman culture, the Greek culture, and all of those things to help us understand why John wrote to those seven churches and then each week each of the seven weeks will unpack each of the churches and be challenged by that material so if you'd like to participate in that we would like you to sign up so that we have the appropriate room we're not sure how many people will be attending that so if you could sign up on the website uh, that would be wonderful all right so uh our next uh, big youth fundraising activity is something called run a team and we're going to be running that through uh this month through the first week in june and the idea behind red and team uh is to help our students who have signed up to go to momentum uh to earn funds uh, for that and they also are a benefit to the church so if you notice like out uh, in like the walkthrough area you're going to see a board with like little uh little cards on, on the board uh you fill out that card and you put it back there and once we have kids sign up for renatine uh we'll contact uh that kid and we'll have that kid contact you to fulfill that job so that way uh kids they're earning their money to go to momentum and they're also a benefit to our little church and teens will have information for you this week how to sign up for renatine for those who are going to momentum this summer it's great. Uh, we had camp as normal last year, but we'll be having momentum this year finally back to normal as well as summer camp. And it's, it's good for our teens to be able to raise funds for that, to be able to have those experiences that really change your life. It's something you remember the rest of your life. I remember my experiences at camp and momentum when I was young, a long, long time ago. I mean, so was it wasn't that long, it right? It was pretty long ago. Okay, it was a long time ago. Longer okay. than 
than, than you, Daryl. Wow. All right, let's, uh, let's go to prayer as we ask the Lord to bless our service today. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here to worship, to be together with our family. Thank you for uh, the way you've worked in our lives this week. Some have carried some heavy burdens. Some are struggling right now with physical issues or just uh, maybe they're struggling emotionally. Just issues maybe with their family or work or, or just life in general. But we're so thankful that we're able to take some time out to really recenter those thoughts on you, Jesus, because you're what you're who life is about. Thank you that we're able to worship you, that you're our creator, that you're the one in control of our lives, and that you're our savior, and you've come to provide for each of us in our lives. We do pray for those who are hurting right now, and there are many. Uh, we especially want to thank of uh, Colin Lloyd and his family, as Colin is dealing with blood clots, and we pray that as he's at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh, you just bless him and as well as Jim and Laura and their family and how this has really uh, just uh, put a lot of stress on them this week. But we pray for full healing and that uh, you can bring healing to his body and uh, restore him as a young person. And just thank you, too, uh, for how you're working in each of our lives um, in keeping us healthy. For us who are healthy, we we, we should never take for granted our health and be thankful. And I think of uh, Jim Miller as well as he uh, is struggling right now. We pray that you would just bless him physically and, and help him at this time in his life. And we pray for uh, Brian um, uh, Heater as well as he is dealing with cancer as well. And there are others. I'm sure there are some that are dealing with health issues that we're not aware of that are unspoken. We just pray that you would just really bless him in these areas. And, Think of Shelly Longneck as well as she continues to battle cancer, going through many, many battles as it has continued to reoccur. It can get really discouraging out there. It can get really discouraging in life, but we trust you. We know that you're faithful to us, and it's so good that we can sing and praise you. We have a lot to be thankful for because you're kind and loving to us in the midst of the struggle. So bless our time in your word today. In Christ's name we pray. good to be here this morning. I had a couple of big events last week or the week before. I got cleared to play guitar again, so that was exciting. And then we had our second son, Max, and stayed home with uh, Laura and the kids last week. It's fun to say kids plural. Uh, somehow I managed to get sick in the midst of all this and lost my voice at one point. Raise your hand if you heard my voice crack in the first song. I see those hands. Yeah, that's fine. Seriously, my sister didn't hear it. That's amazing. I'm surprised. Uh, I, I thought it was funny. Listen on the live stream later, I guess. That has nothing to do with what's happening. Let's stand and sing together um, about the grace of God. Your face was sad. 
in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. The spirit you made me see. I swore I knew the way on my own. And full of rocks, a heart made of stone. The spirit you moved in. series we'll be talking about God is our creator um, and in keeping in that vein I wanted to read from Psalm 8 before we sing the next couple of songs it says this O Lord our Lord how majestic is your name in all the earth you've set your glory above the heavens out of the mouths of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the Avenger when I look at your heavens the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with honor and glory. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the creator God that we continue to sing, sing to, sing about, and praise as we sing this morning. So let's keep those thoughts in mind and in our hearts as we sing. Catch your breath 
what you heard this morning was what was pleasing to you and I hope as we were singing these lyrics that we were able to uh, encourage one another about your greatness and how your creation uh, points points to you. I pray as we uh, dig into your word that we would have a better understanding of, of who you are and, and our place uh, in your creation. We, we give this prayer in your name. Amen. You may be seated. All right. And elementary school kids, this side, uh, preschool, this side over here. Uh, 
This morning we are continuing uh, our series in the gospel, and as you can tell uh, from a lot of our songs this morning, uh, we talked about creation, and we're going to be talking about uh, God as creator uh, this morning. Uh, and as we dig into that truth, something we're also going to be looking at is uh, a different worldview as well. Uh, a quote I want to share with you, it comes from a guy named Carl Sagan, and Carl Sagan, uh, he said this, the cosmos is all there is or was or ever will be. Has anyone ever heard this quote from Carl Sagan before? Like, old TV show, like astronomer and science and all that, and his whole world view is that there's nothing but the material world, that all there is is the cosmos, all there is is the physical world, that's all there is, that's all there was, or all there ever will be. And the reason why I'm sharing Carl Sagan's uh, quote this morning is uh, how many of us fall into that trap. How many of us go about living our lives as if all there really is, is this, that, that we're not conscious of a reality of God, that if all there is, is the cosmos that as beautiful as it is to look up at a night sky and, and to stare at the stars, if you buy into that reality, uh, it becomes a really dark thing because all of life depends on you. That you got here randomly on this planet, you'll die randomly on this planet, and then you'll cease to exist if all there is is the cosmos. But fortunately for us as believers, we know this quote isn't true. We know there's another reality. We know that it just isn't the cosmos. There just isn't chaos. That we're told in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, we're, we're told this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The two staunch realities, the two staunch worldviews, or maybe not two realities, but two worldviews that are out there. One worldview, all there is is the cosmos. All there is is randomness. Then the Christian worldview, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And because God created the heavens and the earth, that means our lives are accountable to God, that at the end of the day, we are not our own president. We are not the captains of our fate, but there is a real God that we are really accountable to. And we see here that God created the heavens and the earth. We see the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Remember, our God is Trinity, that our God has revealed himself in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three individuals who make up one God. So we see God the Father here, we see the Holy Spirit. So where's, where's Jesus, right? If, if God is Trinity, where is Jesus? Well, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, it tells us where Jesus was during creation. This is what we see. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So we're told from Colossians chapter 1 and other places in the New Testament that Jesus was there at creation and he was with God the Father. He was with God the Holy Spirit and he was in the process 
of creating all things in this world. So uh, a term here that can be confusing, uh, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. There are some people, when they see this phrase, the firstborn of all creation, they say this, that Jesus, he's not equal to God. He's a God. He was created by God because Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Well, when you read the text that way, you're reading it wrong. Uh, It doesn't say that Jesus was the first created thing by God. It says Jesus was the firstborn of all creation. And that's not semantics. That, That really does matter how we say that phrase. Reason why? Because, remember, this was written in the first century to a first century audience. And the term firstborn it meant something different to them than what it means to us. So the t- it was actually a title. The title of firstborn in the first century, it meant this, that he is in the first order of all things, that he is preeminent over all things, that the firstborn had the rightful authority to all things. So The title firstborn, it wasn't based off birth order. It was based off preeminency. And you even see that uh, in Genesis when Joseph has two kids and he wants to give his rights to the firstborn son. God says, no, it's the secondborn son that's going to have the firstborn title. So what we're seeing here, it's not that Jesus is created is that he is the firstborn of all creation, that all creation rightly belongs to him, that Jesus has created all things, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, that Jesus wasn't created by God, Jesus was with God, and being with God the Father, he was involved in creating everything in creation, and because of that, Jesus has a rightful say over everything in creation. Why? Because all creation was created for him, and by him, and through him, which brings us to this first point I I want to share with us. Creation points to a creator. Creation points to a creator. That everything in this world tells you there is a creator, and that creator is God. So then our question becomes this. In what areas of your life Are you living as if God does not exist? In what areas of your life this morning would you say Jesus isn't preeminent, that he isn't the firstborn? Or or worse, what ways are you living your life as if you were a functioning atheist? as if God didn't exist. So uh, to help us with this, I have some verses I want to show you. They're from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8, verses 11 through 18. And we're going to look at it in sections. What's happening uh, in these verses, you have Moses. He's talking to the children of Israel before they enter the promised land. And this is his warning he gives to them. He says this. Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes when I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart Be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and continuing, who led you through great and terrifying wilderness, 
with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you with the wilderness with, with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers at, at, its, and at its this day. So what's happening here, Moses warns the Israelites. He says, hey, be careful. Like when God blesses you and you go on the promised land and you have your flocks and you get your gold and you get your silver and you build your houses. Like be careful because the temptation in your heart is to say, look what I have done. Look at me. Look, look how I built my kingdom. Look how I built my resources. Moses is saying, be careful of that. Right? He says, hey, remember, it's God that gave you the ability to get wealth. Remember, it was God that gave you the ability to build your life. It's God that strengthened your family. Don't say in your own heart, I did this. That oftentimes, success and wealth, when it should drive us in thankfulness to God, it can drive us away from God. And we start thinking, look how great we are. And in reality, it's supposed to be pointing back to the greatness of God. So this morning, when I asked you that question, in which ways are you living your life, right, that, that God isn't there like what ways are you living your life independently of God what about your resources what about your wealth does the way you use your credit cards or debit cards or, or money does it point back that there's a God in your life that you are accountable to or does it point to you trying to build your own kingdom. Or it becomes this, because you, you earned nice things, life boils down to survival, that because God has blessed you in such ways, and when you forget that it's God who's giving you the strength to have the things that you have, the temptation becomes, it all ends with you. It all rides on you that you have to be smart enough. You have to be resourceful enough. You have to be strong enough. You have to be the end all for everything. What's the warning that Moses gives? Remember your God. This morning, remember, you're not the creator, you're part of creation. You're accountable to God. All the blessings you have, remember your God, lest you say in your heart how great you are. And one way uh, that we make sure we keep our hearts grounded with God is your quiet time. Uh, I, I've been challenged this week. I had lunch with an elder and he talked with me about the importance of a quiet time. And then I heard someone else uh, late, uh, later this week, uh, this past week, talk about the importance of a quiet time. And I realized how much I struggle with a quiet time. And what do I mean by a quiet time? Like time you have just set uh, with God. And how important it is to have that. Uh, and I'll tell you, uh, I think people, we have this tendency of wanting to do things for God. Like the whole story of Mary and Martha and Jesus. And when Jesus came to visit these two sisters and Martha was doing all these things for Jesus. And she was like wearing herself out to the point she was serving Jesus 
to the point that it was causing discouragement and bitterness in her heart for her own sister. Why? Because when Martha was serving, Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, spending time with him. Jesus isn't looking for you to prove yourself. Jesus desires time with you, which brings me, I want to share something I wrote this week. Our time with God helps us not to live our lives independent of him. The gospel reminds us that God desires to be with us. Do you desire to be with God? Creation points to a creator that God created all of this in the hope that you would reach out to him. If, if the Bible tells us anything, it tells us God wants to be known. That, that God's not playing hide and seek with us. That God wants to be known and God wants to be known by you. Think about this. The master of the universe, he desires time with you. He desires time with me. That it's not proving myself to God. But it's coming to God, knowing he wants to be with me. Man, that's amazing. That's amazing. And how you do your quiet time, I don't know how you want to do it. Everyone's not a reader. I get that. Maybe you connect with God through Christian music. Uh, for some of you, maybe it's going to take you a walk in a park or maybe it's out being in nature. I would say if you like really nature, be careful because like black bear season, they're coming out soon and they're, they, are, they are predators. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But anyways, how do you connect with God? The question isn't, does God want to be with you? The question is, do you want to be with God? And your time with God you'll be a far better person for it. Why? Because it will remind you that you didn't get where you got in life by your own strength, but that there's a real God who's really helping you. So once again, where are you living your life as a functioning atheist, as all there is is the cosmos? Don't be that person. Live your life in such a way that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So uh, the second thing that causes us issues to being close with God, uh, it would be this right here. A picture of a clock. And no, it's not about time. I know that's what you could think. Uh, so there's this something out there. There's this idea that atheism isn't true, that there is a God, but what God did, he, it's like the watch, it's like the clockmaker. This guy created a clock, he started the clock, and then he walks away from the clock, that someone made the clock because there's a clock, but once this clock is made, the clockmaker is hands off. And this idea is called deism, and I'll show you what deism says right here. Deism is the belief God created the universe but leaves it to function on its own. That atheism says there's no God. Things just happen randomly. Deism says, no, there is a God. He created the world, but he's hands off with it. That he just lets things go wherever they go. Once again, the Bible is not deism. Our God is not this. We're told in Matthew uh, chapter 10, verse 29, uh, 29 through 31, Jesus is talking with the disciples, and what does he tell them? He tells them this. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? 
but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. That why does Jesus talk with his disciples about sparrows? Because uh, in this system, uh, they had to do animal sacrifices. And if you were incredibly poor, if you couldn't afford a lamb or a goat, you could afford a sparrow because two sparrows are sold for a penny. That no one cares about sparrows because they're insignificant. But what, what do we know about God? God cares about sparrows. That something that is so insignificant to people, we're told that a sparrow doesn't die without God being aware of that sparrow dying, that God is so intimately a part of his creation, the things that no one else notices, God notices. And if God notices sparrows dying, how much more is God aware of your life? How much more does God care? How much more does God know about the workings and the routines and everything that's happening in your world. My friends, there is a creation. God is our creator, and we're accountable to him. But we're accountable to a good God that knows all the details of our lives. And as good as that sounds, uh, maybe you're hearing this sermon right now and you have some objections that are raising in your heart that, okay, Daryl, you say God is a creator. I get that. I, I, I buy that God's real, right? I know he's out there, but, but here are two issues that I have, and here are the two issues that people run into at times, and we'll bring that up. Okay, wow. Thanks, Nate. I forgot that point right there. First, Jesus reminds us that God cares for all his creation, especially humans. And the two details that we run into or the two objections would be this. What do you do when you desire the things of creation more than God? What do you do when you believe God is absent from your life? So everything we said about God sounds good, but when you hit these two problems, because you say, I'm accountable to God, okay? So if I'm accountable to God, what do I do when I desire things more than him? And why am I accountable to a God who feels pretty much absent from my life? Number one, when you desire things of creation more than God. Remember Solomon. Remember Solomon. That Solomon was the wisest man to ever live. Uh, Solomon was probably one of the richest men to ever live. That when Solomon was young, he desired to be close to God. When Solomon got older in life, uh, temptation, uh, things of creation pulled him away from God that nobody partied more than Solomon. Nobody had more nice things than Solomon. No one had more physical intimacy in their life than Solomon. And yet Solomon said, when it was all said and done, is he said it all left him empty. That when Solomon looked back at his life, he tried everything creation had to offer, and he told himself, I should have stayed with God. I was far better off with God. My friends, when you feel this pull away from God, remember nothing in creation is better than the Creator. Learn from Solomon's life so you don't have to make his same mistakes. Uh, also, we learn from the Apostle Paul that 
in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, we have Paul, and he talks about his relationship with Jesus, that Paul, as he went deeper into the gospel, because remember, as Pastor Brent said this morning, the gospel is just not for uh, non-believers, it's for believers too. As Pastor Brian mentioned last week, when he talked about uh, the book of Romans, Paul was writing to Christians, and Paul said, I desire to share the gospel with you. Why? Because the deeper you go into the gospel, the more you walk with Jesus, the more beautiful Jesus should become to you. And the more beauty that Jesus has, look what Paul says. But whatever gain I had, I, had, I counted as loss. For the sake of Christ, indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. That as Paul pursued Jesus, Jesus became more attractive to him. That's why we're doing this gospel series. That's why we're explicitly talking about the gospel because all of God's word, it points to Christ. And what we want for you and what I want for myself is that I want a deeper walk with Christ that Jesus becomes so beautiful. I could say like Paul, man, everything else pales in comparison. And guess what? It's not that Paul's a super Christian. The same God that worked in Paul's life is working in my life and working in your life. And that same Paul that had that same access to the gospel, so do you. So do you. But do you believe that for yourself? Or are you talking yourself out of that right now? Like, wh what do you talk to yourself? The reason uh, Pastor Brian said last week, Preach the gospel to yourself. And as you're preaching the gospel to yourself, the more beautiful Jesus becomes and the more Jesus becomes the desire of our heart. So uh, let's talk about problem number two, though. What happens when you feel God is absent from your life? Uh, maybe it falls to one of these three categories. One part of living in a fallen world is longing for Jesus to return. That part of living in this world, there's going to be a deep ache. There's going to be a longing for Christ. Uh, if you read Romans uh, chapter 8, I have in my sermon reflection questions, it says that the creation is groaning, that creation yearns to be saved. And because you are part of that creation, there's going to be times when God feels absent in your life. And that doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Remember the story of Job? That Job chapter 1 and 2, Job is, he's walking with God, things are going well, then things just go chaotic. Did God move, what did, what did Job do to feel God not in his life? Nothing. But part of living in a fallen world is having that angst and feeling that separation from God. Uh, two, is there sin in your life that you have not dealt with that unconfessed sin does create a barrier between you and God? So remember, number one, 
living in a fallen world, you're going to have seasons where God feels absent, and that doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Number two, though, examine your heart. Is there anything going on there that would cause separation or would cause friction in your relationship with God? And when you hit number one and number two, the beauty is this. God gave you a church family that when you feel absent from God, you weren't meant to feel that alone. But having a church family there to rally you through your spiritual highs and your spiritual lows. Two, is there sin in your life that you have not dealt with? Once again, God gave you a church family to help you deal with that issue so that you don't have to walk around with the burden of sin alone. That God gives you men and women. He gives you friends, teachers, pastors, elders to help you with your sin struggles. Or we hit number three, when God feels absent in your life, do this practice right here, and we'll look at this. Stare in a mirror. Why? One, 90% of the time, you'll find someone attractive staring back at you. 90% 90% of the time, at least. But the, the reason why you stare into the mirror is this. Look at Psalm 94. Psalm 94, 6 through 9. What, what's happening in these verses, you have people that feel far from God because of circumstances that are pretty bad. And it says this. They kill the widow and the sojourner, that's traveler, and murderer of the fatherless. And they say, the Lord does not see, the God of Jacob does not perceive. Understand, O dullest of the people, fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? So, uh, Nate, do me a favor. Go back to that slide with the mirror. So, when you feel God is absent, stare in the mirror. And as you're staring in the mirror, do you see an eye staring back at you in that mirror? Well, if you do, he who created the eye, he does see. God sees what's happening in your life. When you stare in the mirror, do you see an ear in that reflection? Well, if you see an ear in that reflection, remember, he who planted the ear, he he does hear. Even when God feels absent in your life, he sees what's happening. He sees, he hears what's happening, that when your feelings tell you God doesn't see, God doesn't hear, your feelings are lying to you. Creation points to a creator. So then we we hit this situation then. All that sounds good. But what about the bad things that happen in my life? Why am I accountable to a God that allows specific bad things in my life? That doesn't seem fair. Um, when, when that happens, I don't know if I have a specific answer for why specific bad things have happened to you in life. 
And I think at times we can over-deliver or we can under-deliver and both are bad. You don't want to over-deliver people things about God, but you also don't want to under-deliver as well. And we talk about God and we talk about why bad things happen to people generally because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world because we live in a fallen world. Bad things happen to people. But why specific bad things happen to people? How can you answer that question? Right? Remember I told you about Job? When bad things happen to Job, Job's friends, they try to give him specific answers why bad things happened to him. They over-delivered, and God said they were wrong. God said they were wrong because they tried to be so specific. And I know we want specific answers. We want the answer to the question, why that thing happened. I know there's things in my life that have happened, and I ask, okay, God, why did that specifically happen in my life? And if I don't have an answer for myself, how on earth do I have an answer for you? But I do know this. At a certain point, you have to quit asking the question, why? Because it could put you in a really dark place. And you have to ask the question, what now? What now? And, and I know this. Even though I don't know why specifically bad things happen to me, I know because of the gospel and the message of that gospel. And I want you to look at the message of that gospel right now. God's plan to redeem sinners through the life, death, resurrection, and return of Jesus. I know for all the pain that's in my life, I know all the pain in your life, it can find healing in Jesus. I can guarantee you that. That's not over-delivery. The message of the gospel, God redeems sinners. God redeems the hurt that sinners go through through the life, death, resurrection, and return of Jesus. As Ryan comes up here right now, I want to talk to you about a guy named Isaac Watts. And Isaac Watts in his life, basically, who, who's Isaac Watts? Isaac Watts was the Ryan Ritchie of his day. Uh, he wrote hymns, wrote songs, played songs. Like, Isaac Watts, he, he's, he's a fascinating guy. Well, Isaac Watts went through a very dark period in his life. And he wrote this to a friend. I am persuaded that in a future state, we shall take a sweet review of those scenes of providence which have been involved in the thickest darkness and trace those footsteps of God when he walked with us through the deepest waters. This will be a surprising delight to have those perplexing riddles laid open to the eyes of our souls and read the full meaning of them in set characters of wisdom and grace. What Isaac Watts is saying here is this. Bad things have happened to me, and I don't know why, but I trust in the goodness of God. I trust that whatever happened in my life, God allowed it in his wisdom and his grace. And he's going to heal me, and I can trust him. We can trust God with the hurt in our life. Remember, we are part of his creation. We are accountable to an all-good, all-loving, all-powerful God. 
join me in prayer. Uh, thank you, uh, dear Jesus. Thank you, dear Jesus, that your creation points us to you, that you are the firstborn of all creation, that you are preeminent, that, that you're over everything. And I pray that we would remind ourselves we are accountable to you. I pray that we wouldn't look at ourselves as sovereigns. We wouldn't look at ourselves as, as the end all of everything, but we would realize that you've blessed us, you've given us good things. I pray that when we question your authority over us because of the pain in our lives, that you're not frustrated with us, but you're gracious with us. And I pray as we sing this next song, it sounds sweet in your ears. We give this prayer in your name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. What do we learn about God from his creation? That's something to think about, to talk about this week. Uh, another question to consider. In what ways does creation let us know that we live in a fallen world? Sometimes we look around and see how things are and think, God, why did you make them this way? Um, in reality, we live in a fallen world and creation's affected in every single way by that. Um, but we have a creator, God, and, and we learn about him from his creation. It all points to him. Um, so feel free to, to check out our follow-up resources. Uh, and there's a couple more uh, really good questions and some uh, additional scripture that Daryl put on there to check out. Uh, I also wanted to point out that our kids this month are studying the same topics every week. So if you have elementary age kids, 
or, or pre-K kids, um, get on the same website and you can find resources for them too. And I, I trust you to have a great family discussion about today's topic as God is creator. Um, let, let's pray together before we leave. God, you are our creator. Help us to remember that this week um, and in our, action, in our interactions, in our um, actions. Uh, just help us to, to see you in, in new ways this week. Um, help us to grow closer to you. Help us to remember why it's so important that we understand this gospel that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, you're dismissed. I did want to point out there are some extra Forge and Refine booklets right out those doors. I know some people were looking for those, so make sure you grab one if you need one. Have a great week.